Good morning and welcome to our panel today, Show Me the Money. It promises to be the best panel in all of National Clean Energy Week, I can promise you. Uh, we're very excited to be tackling tax and finance issues as they relate to the energy sector and the move toward more clean and renewable energy. My name is Brandon Arnold. I am the Executive Vice President of National Taxpayers Union. And again, I'm thrilled to be part of this panel today. Uh, before we get to the substance of this conversation, let me just note quickly that there is an opportunity for you, the audience, to participate and ask questions of our panelists. There should be a tab on your screen that says Speaker q and If you click on that, you can submit your questions and we'll do our best to address those. You also have the ability, if you see a question that you like from another audience member, to upvote that to provide some weight to that vote. If I see that, I will give special attention to that and be sure to try to uh, field that question for our panelists. So with that, what we're going to do is uh, invite our panel on a one-by-one -one basis to give a quick overview of their uh, organization or company's position on the biggest tax vehicle that has passed in recent memory, perhaps ever, as it relates to clean energy. That is, of course, the Inflation Reduction Act. One interesting thing, and one reason I really like National Clean Energy Week is it brings a diverse set of viewpoints to the table here. I can tell you my organization, National Taxpayer Union, strongly opposed this piece of legislation. I think our panelists are much more supportive of it, but we'll have, I think, a really interesting and robust discussion of the pros and cons of this legislation and what we think will probably be a positive impact on the move to cleaner energy. So with that, I'm gonna give a quick overview of the panelists and there are more detailed bios available, of course, on the website. But our first panelist uh, I will mention is Bill Parsons. He is the Vice President for Federal and State Affairs at American Clean Power Association. He was previously the Chief Operating Officer at American Council on Renewable Energy, or ACOR. He also spent a considerable amount of time on Capitol Hill as a Chief of Staff and LD for Congressman, now Senator Chris Van Hollen. After Bill, we'll turn to Mark Pangburn, who is the Executive Vice President and show co-chief investment uh, officer of Hannon Armstrong. Uh, he brings a considerable amount of know-how to this uh, conversation, particularly in the applied sense. He also worked in uh, a solar development and financing company called MP2 Capital. Uh, following Mark, we will turn to Ray Long. He is the senior vice president for external affairs at Clearway. He brings 25 years of experience to the energy and renewable conversation, including 15 years at NRG. And we'll wrap things up with John DeStacio, who is the president of the Large Public Power Council, the former general manager and CEO of the Sacramento, Sacramento Municipal Utility District, and also a wine expert, though I don't know if we'll be able to get into that in the confines of a 60-minute conversation. So Bill, we'll start with you, like I said, and what I'd like you to do is kind of set the table here. When talk about the Inflation Reduction Act, talk about your organization, your personal views on this piece of legislation and how you see it affecting energy markets. And please try to do so in about a couple minutes. I apologize for this, the brevity of this segment here. You bet, no problem, Brandon. Good to be with you and the rest of my colleagues. Thanks to uh, Heather and the Krez team for the invitation. You know, uh, words like uh, generational or, or transformative um, historic can be overused uh, in the nation's capital. I will tell you that from uh, ACP's perspective, we think those words are uh, apt here. Um, representing the utility scale clean power industry, and we, we define that as wind, solar, energy, storage, green hydrogen, and the transmission that enables um, all of those technologies. Uh, this, 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 we've never had this kind of certainty before. Like any business, businesses need certainty to plan. They need to plan to execute. Um, I think in terms of top line takeaways um, from the IRA, um, we've never had 10 plus years of full value clean energy tax platform before. We've had, we've had to live with on again, off again. Um, this gives our member companies the runway to plan with certainty to attract the capital needed to drive deployment, to accelerate deployment relative to a baseline without that plat tax platform. And um, of course that will show up in a lower delivered price uh, for consumers. Uh, that length, that duration, that value is unprecedented uh, and is significant. 
Next thing I'd want to call out is there are new incentives in the Inflation Reduction Act uh, around freestanding energy storage, around green hydrogen. A lot of our members are really excited about those. Uh, offshore wind, I would also note, in, is in terms of an emerging um, kind of market technology, uh, is 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 really set to launch um, um, in part due uh, to the support provided by the IRA. Um, there are incentives in the IRA to drive deployment where um, historically it hasn't taken place quite as much uh, in certain defined energy communities in low-income areas. And there are also incentives to drive uh, reshoring of the clean energy supply chain, uh, which we think are going to be very uh, significant. Um, uh, on the supply chain, um, uh, there's a, 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 a new advanced manufacturing production tax credit that's designed to lower the delivered price of domestically produced uh, clean energy technology uh, on a levelized basis with what's available internationally. Um, you know, no no industry is 100% integrated, you know, sort of domestically, but I think there's a lot of interest certainly in the Congress to reshore more of our supply chain. I get that from our members. I think it's going to be a very, I, I, think, I think we are on the verge of uh, you know, reshoring a significant chunk, uh, you know, in pieces over time uh, of the clean energy supply chain. I think that's going to be good for the industry. I think that's going to be good uh, for jobs um, uh, and for you know participation in a high growth area of the economy, um, on, on renewable finance, which is a, a, a focus of this um, uh, session, uh, we, we got a limited amount of, uh, of of direct pay for for uh, for hydrogen carbon capture and the advanced manufacturing uh, production tax credit I mentioned. Um, uh, I, I think that that's important uh, uh, to the degree that the, the levels of projected deployment may uh, run the risk of exhausting exi existing tax equity supply. And we do not want tax equity supply to become the new governor on our ability to deploy. We want we want markets and climate science to dictate that, not and, and not the availability year in and year out of tax equity. Um, and I guess lastly, in terms of what this all means for the industry, uh, our internal modeling does show that it keeps us, um, you know, kind of on track within distance of internationally you know, recognized uh, uh, climate targets for decarbonization in the power sector, uh, which will you know, disproportionately contribute to economy-wide decarbonization in the near term, thing one. Thing two, uh, we think that the IRA is going to support well over a million uh, jobs. That, that's important. And then for the, for the sector writ large, we did about 30 gigs of uh, utility-scale deployment in 2021. That number is going to be closer to 90 gigawatts. Uh, at the end of this decade. So a, a big growth opportunity here for ACP members. Uh, we've got several of them on this panel. And uh, having set the table like that, why don't I throw it back to you, Brandon? Awesome. Thank you, Bill. Really appreciate your comments there. Now we'll uh, turn things over to Mark from Hannon Armstrong. Mark, can you give us two minutes of your overview? Great. Thank you, Brennan. Uh, and thanks, for everyone, for joining. Uh, Mark Pangburn, Co-Chief Investment Officer of Hannon Armstrong. We're one of the largest and most established investors in wind, solar, and energy efficiency projects in the U.S., uh, both large scale and, and small, and uh, are happy to be a trusted capital provider to a number of different clients, including Clearway Energy and, and Ray, my panelist, uh, co-panelist here. In terms of, from an investor perspective, how we see the IRA impacting the industry, and again, picking up on some of the comments from Bill, um, it's really the long-term runway. That plus the greatly expanded um, market opportunity really provides the uh, focus from an investor perspective that's needed to lower the cost of capital and just bring in more participants into the industry. Um, that combined with actually tying these credits to GHG reductions, we view as critical in terms of facilitating the energy transition. So. We're very excited to be at the early stages of this and much work to do. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, now we're going to go to Ray Long. As I mentioned, he's the Senior Vice President of External Affairs at Clearway. Ray? Gotcha. Thank you. Um, and for those of you who are on, who are expecting Natalie Jackson, Jackson on, who's our Senior Vice President of um, of finance. Um, apologies, I am certainly not her, um, although I'm going to try to fill some of her shoes here. Um, 
So Clearway is a, is a large owner, operator, and developer of clean energy projects in the United States. We've got about a 7.5 gigawatt portfolio of installed projects now across 26 states. So we've got a large portfolio. The interesting side uh, of our company, um, which is germane to this discussion, is the growth side. We've got a 30 gigawatt pipeline of, um, of development projects, which includes um, utility scale solar, wind, um, storage, and a variety of other things that we're looking at um, to build as well. Um, put 30 gigawatts uh, of a development pipeline in perspective, it's massive. Um, if we do, if we bring online two gigawatts a year, um, that keeps our construction crews um, operational for the next 15 years. That's, it's, it's enormous uh, for any one company. And yet you've got a number of companies who are in the audience today and participating here who have made similar investments in pipelines over the past few years um, in anticipation of things like the IRA coming together and passing. So I, I agree with, uh, with Mark and Bill's um, assessment of the bill. And I just want to put it in context for what a company like Clareway is doing and what our motivations are and why this is so significant. And, I, and I'll be brief about it. We can talk more about it later. Our, um, um, uh, the investment that we're making as a whole are being made in, because of what our customers are looking for and what customers are looking for at projects you know, have, has remained unchanged in the industry for years. They want competitive prices. They want a reliable product. They want reliable electricity and they want their power to be, uh, for the most part, clean or in some instances, very clean. And, um, and renewable energy has been on track to provide all three of those things. And in that order, competitive prices, reliability and clean uh, for quite a while. And the growth that we've seen over the past several years is indicative of that. What the IRA does is it supercharges the growth and the speed at which we're going to be able to move forward with this. And, and Bill highlighted some things which I think are, are significant here, but let me just put it in context of one of the 20 states where we've got it, and that's West Virginia. We're currently the largest investor in clean energy projects in West Virginia. Last year alone, we invested over $650 million in, um, in repowering one wind site and, and bringing online a completely new greenfield site. Going forward in the wake of the IRA, we have eight more projects slated for West Virginia. The total is over a $3 billion investment in the state, would put over a thousand people uh, construction jobs to work um, during that period. And uh, seven out of those eight projects are in what are, what are called energy communities. Those are communities that have been disadvantaged by the shutdown of coal plants, by mines and other things like that. So it brings economic viability back into those communities. And there's, there's actually an incentive for an, in the IRA for investment in those communities as a whole. So when we talk about the IRA as a whole, this is real meaningful accelerated investment that helps give customers competitive prices, reliability, and of course, clean energy. But it's, a, but it's also a major driver for the, uh, for the economy across the United States. And, and with that, I just wanna close with, um, several of us here had the opportunity to go to the White House with um, about 3,000 of our closest friends the other day and, uh, and celebrate the passage of the IRA. And on the way in, there was an NGO that was handing out these, and I don't know if you can see it, but it says, I'm a climate superhero. It's, it's a really nice sentiment, uh, but on the way in, a number of us were talking about it. And I think, I think the rhetoric around the IRA and the media coverage and so forth usually puts climate first, and, and that's important. But when you look at the things that are driving the concerns of people, you know, kitchen table issues today, it's not necessarily the most important thing. And the most important things that the IRA brings to the table are the things that are bipartisan issues as a whole. It's creating jobs, it's driving the United States economy, it's creating manufacturing jobs here in the United States. It's onshoring supply chains to make sure that we can get products when we need it to move, move the, all these things forward. And those are the things that I think that are most significant and need to be prioritized first when we talk about the IRA. And I'll stop there and turn it back. 
Excellent. Thanks, Ray. I love the fact that you're bringing this back to these kitchen table issues, and, and we'll get to that a little bit more uh, later in the conversation. Uh, John, the floor is yours. Good. Thanks, Brandon, and uh, thanks to my colleagues. I, I would just say um, I come at it maybe just a little bit differently. I mean, we were very, very pleased with uh, provisions of the IRA. So my membership includes uh, 27 of the largest municipal electric utilities in the country. We're in 21 states and we serve collectively about 30 million consumers. And as Ray mentioned, I mean, our focus and our underlying incentives are balancing reliability, affordability, and environmental stewardship. So some of the things that we really like about the IRA is that it provides us optionality. And by that, I mean the direct pay provisions that Bill mentioned um, really help us because we're not for profit and we don't pay taxes. And so we've long argued over the issues of comparability when energy incentives historically have been delivered through the tax code. The only way we could access them as not for profit utilities was to find a tax paying counterparty. And oftentimes there's a lot of leakage in that, and sometimes there's not the same uh, flexibility. There can be complicated arrangements. Uh, the other option for us is just to go out and, and get a uh, purchase power agreement. But again, sometimes the flexibility uh, wasn't there for us or the terms that um, were favorable. We have to do things in a portfolio. So we like to own assets. We like to operate assets. Um, so the IRA, by giving us uh, direct pay, gives us an equal footing to be able to have the optionality to either continue to use a purchase power agreement to uh, buy clean energy, or we can actually direct pay and own it ourselves and operate it within our existing fleets. Um, I think the other thing I would say is that I, for us, it was already mentioned, but having certainty and having a runway is significant. So it really does help um, with investment decisions if you have some certainty over um, how long the runway is and, and what you need to do and how you factor that into your planning. So we see a lot of good things. And then probably the other thing, but it's a little bit arcane, but um, for us, we got uh, sequestration proofing, which was very significant because uh, in the Build America bonds of 2008, 2009, um, many of our members issued Build America bonds that, that was a direct pay type mechanism as well. Uh, to the tune of about $14 billion. And then after the fact, they were subject to sequestration and we got a haircut on the payment from Treasury. So we were very, um, we pushed very hard to make sure that these were sequestration proof this time and, and we're able to get that across the finish line. So we look forward uh, to the Treasury guidance and we look forward to the discussion. But uh, generally, I agree with my colleagues. This is uh, one of the most significant things I've seen in, in uh, my career span in the utility sector. Excellent, thank you for that, John, really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna throw out a question for the panel. Before I do, let me note again that our audience members do have the ability to submit questions in the system there, the speaker Q&A tab. Please, anything that's on your mind that you wanna ask of this panel, uh, we invite the questions um, that you guys have on your mind. Uh, let me ask something that kind of touches on uh, what a few of you said, and that relates to tariffs and trade policy. There's a lot of uncertainty out there in the, the, the trade space right now, not just tariffs that impact solar panels, that impact raw materials like steel and aluminum, but there's enormous supply chain disruptions. Um, I personally would like to see a lot of these tariffs just lifted. That hasn't taken place. But there are some provisions perhaps in the IRA that could help ameliorate some of that disruption and some of that financial impact. Talk to me a little bit about trade policy, about tariff policy, and how that might be impacting your industry and your organization. And maybe I'll start with, with Mark, though I invite everyone to, to jump in here. Uh, you on the happy spot. to start. Uh, although I, I suspect Bill and Ray might have a, uh, a more in-depth uh, dealing given that they have to live and breathe it every single day. Um, we very much see it impacting all of our clients, um, and it is something that 
needs to get solved to actually be successful in realizing the full value of the IRA. Um, I don't know if uh, we've necessarily seen tariffs incentivize domestic manufacturing, but I do think that they, as you mentioned, there are provisions within the IRA combined with some of the supply chain uncertainty that uh, uh, we are very much seeing, again, our, our clients focus on, on moving to a domestic supply chain. Um, but, but again, I, I will pass it off to Bill and Ray for perhaps more in-depth detail. Brandon, um, I, listen, I, I, I appreciate the question. I think you make a very good point. One of, the, one of the learnings here, I just think from a policy perspective, is if, you know, so when, when people reach for tariffs, why are they reaching for tariffs? And, and typically they are trying to encourage domestic manufacturing. That's, that's, the, that's the idea. Um, you know, query whether, whether that theory of the case has proven out over time. I think in, in, the, in the clean power industry's experience, the answer is no, but that is, is not a prescription for sort of saying, well, never mind a domestic supply chain. The IRA is presenting an alternative policy approach that, that we're meaningfully more excited about that we think has a meaningfully greater chance of being realistically uh, successful. Uh, and, and that relates to the things like the advanced manufacturing production tax credit for qualifying wind, solar, battery, and upstream critical mineral uh, extraction. Um, and listen, I, I think it's all to the good. The, 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 it's where the, where the supply chains live today is not coincidental. This, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's a consequence of, of public policy in the United States and other places for the last decade or two. Uh, we're perfectly capable of uh, adopting supportive policies here that can begin to reassure that. I think the IRA is beginning to do that in a way that's much more likely to be um, uh, effective. And so I, I, I appreciate the question. And um, I, you know, on other trade stuff, you know, we, we saw this, we saw the solar supply chain basically freeze when, when the auction uh, issue was left unresolved, that, that has now been resolved for at least a 24 month period of time as a result of, of, of how much that just shut down the entire market. Um, you know, it has been against, uh, you know, there's things like the, the Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act, which is in the process of being implemented. Uh, you know, there's a zero tolerance policy in the clean power industry, and it has long been against federal law to be importing anything associated with forced labor. Um, and so uh, there's, there's sort of no daylight in terms of uh, 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 alignment there. We do want to make sure that in, in, the, in the process of, of, of implementing and enforcing the law, our member companies aren't being forced to prove negatives or disprove negatives. We need some clarity in terms of how you can demonstrate compliance um, uh, there. And then lastly, I guess on section 301, um, you know, a little disappointed that the, um, the Biden administration is, is for the time being uh, uh, elected to, to leave those uh, Trump era tariffs in place. I think our members would be interested in a, in a, a more robust and transparent exclusion process and a, and a revisiting of that over time in, 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 with reference to the question that you kind of pointed to at the top with your question, Brandon, which is how successful are these tariffs being in terms of achieving their stated end goal? Uh, and I'd say that what's what's on offer here with the IRA is meaningfully more likely to achieve that objective. Um, gotcha. I I agree with uh, the way the issue has been characterized. Um, let me let me come at it a little bit differently, but from a developer's perspective. Um, so we're a United States based company with a huge pipeline, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and the bottom line is whether you look at um, solar, you look at wind components, you look at battery components. That, that with the demand that exists in the United States today for all three of those technologies, you just can't source everything from domestic manufacturers. So you ask yourself, why? What's the fundamental reason that if a company like mine wants to go out and buy batteries, solar panels, or wind components in the United States, why we can't get everything we need here? And the answer is because the United States over about a three to four decade um, time frame has very intentionally set up a global supply chain with our partners all over the world for these things and you can you can look at all the different countries and the vast majority of countries that we trade with are strategic allies of the united states so we're sourcing now and have been for a long time under u.s policy um, uh, that built up that international supply chain 
Now we're in a situation, at least over the last six years or so, where both Republican and Democratic administrations have prioritized onshoring those manufacturing jobs. And that's a worthwhile exercise to go through. But the important thing that we're finding is you can't flip the switch and do it on a dime. The factories that have been established all over the world to, to build the components for those three technologies are massive. And you do see some, you know, as a result of the tariffs that were put in place under the Trump administration and have continued under the Biden administration. Sure, I mean, you see incremental um, um, increases in production in the United States. But the one constant is, and you'll hear this from manufacturers, is the tariffs in and of themselves do not incentivize the long-term investment in manufacturing that's needed for companies to come in and, and scale up to the level of demand that exists now and is expected to grow under the IRA for the future. And in comes the IRA and the Advanced Manufacturing Tax Credit. So the way we got to that Though that language that's in there is a group of manufacturers that agree with that, that tenant that, hey, we supported tariffs, but it's not enough for us to, to really invest the, uh, the billions of dollars we need to to scale up. We need a real manufacturing incentive program for the long term. And they helped write the advanced manufacturing tax credit language in there. So now we're in a point where we've got this provision in there. You've already seen manufacturers that are making announcements since the IRA passed about building here and scaling up. Now the issue becomes it's going to take two to five years, depending on the technology, to do that. In this interim period, in order for the IRA and everything that companies like mine are doing to get those projects in the ground, we can't have tariffs continue or just slapped on things going forward because the only thing that that's going to serve to do is to drive the cost of our products up. What we need is something along the lines of what I think President Biden tried to do with the, um, uh, with the, uh, the solar tariffs that are being considered now is to say, look, we'll give you a two year runway or, and, and that may not even be enough for manufacturers to scale up. And during that time, companies like ours that invest in this pipeline should be able to source products that they need that they can't get here because they're not produced at scale um, internationally. Once those companies have scaled up in two to five years, I think it's fair game to put tariffs on at that point, because at that point, you'll have a robust market here in the United States that's attempting to meet the demand for this. And to put tariffs on at that time, you're saying, all right, now we can level any disparities that take place in pricing between United States products and those overseas. And companies like mine actually have a shot at sourcing in the United States. Um, and I'll stop there. Hey, Brandon, can I, can I lift up something? Uh, some, something really important that Ray just said, uh, I think this yes, is of course. important maybe for, for folks to appreciate, yeah, is what, what, he, what he said, you know, he's a company like Clearway is looking to source, would like to source domestically and the, the supply isn't there you know, to, to sort of uh, supply the projects. I want to add it and I want to ask Ray to ratify, you know, this understanding at any price. It's not that you just, you know, you, you go glo globally because, you know, you can get a better price. We are literally bumping up against limitations of physical domestic supply relative to domestic demand. So it's not a question of, you know, trying to, trying to, trying to go for the best price you can get. There's a limitation on physical supply. And this is going to be one of, I think Ray's put his finger on something. This is, you know, as we navigate domestic content requirements and, and this area of trade, we're going to need to we're going to need to calibrate this finally, because if, if we miscalibrate it, you're going to see a suppressive effect uh, on deployment, uh, even as we reshore more of the supply chain. So uh, thank you for that. And that, that was a point I was going to make also. I think that it, it's not a matter of uh, price. It's a matter of availability. And I would say, um, you know, to me, Tariffs are a little bit more of a stick in the advanced manufacturing uh, credits are a carrot, but they're going to take some time to uh, fully manifest themselves. What we're seeing in the utility sector is this is not just within the clean energy technology space. It's across the board. Um, 
basic pole top transformers. There's disruptions across all of the different uh, essential commodities that we use for reliability. And so that actually has a negative impact uh, on everything because it's all connected. And so I do think that the sooner that we can uh, see some of that scaling up and, and using hopefully these credits to uh, build scale, but it's a, there's a little bit of a disconnect because the amount of money that's been put on the table in the IRA um, is, is a little bit ahead of where the capacity to fulfill it uh, lives right now. So hopefully these things will, will catch up and hopefully it'll be sooner rather than later. Yeah, thanks for those great responses here. And, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be cynical at all, but it seems like some of these tax credits, the, the, the new investment, the new production tax credit, um, the, the, the consumer vehicle uh, EV tax credit, you know, there's an inherent tension in some of these as we try to move into a cleaner direction. Um, you know, whether they're prevailing wage requirements, whether they're domestic sourcing requirements, they seem to me like they are undermining the inherent goals of this piece of legislation. So maybe again, I'm being too cynical here. Maybe they are, uh, it, by others, viewed as more perfecting amendments that, that have improved things. But to me, they seem like political concessions to put prevailing wage requirements in here to have, uh, while I like the means testing of the EV tax credit, I am concerned about the domestic sourcing requirements, while it may have long-term uh, positive effects on supply chain relocation in the short term, it certainly contracts the availability and reduces the availability of this tax credit to consumers. So I'm wondering if I can get your all's take on that. You know, you've, Brandon, you've called out a, a, a couple different applications of what I'm gonna call, um, uh, adjacent policy priorities, okay? So I, 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 I think properly understood, if you wanna look at kind of congressional intent here, there, there was a desire clearly to deliver the certainty, you know, the level of support to drive, uh, you know, sort of uh, climate informed levels of deployment and so forth. Um, you are quite correctly pointing out that that was not the only objective Congress had in mind, right? So, and, and, and for that reason, you do, you do see, either as a form of, of bonus or as a form of functional you know, requirement, adheres to things like prevailing wage, adherence to things like participation in um, uh, a new apprenticeship uh, uh, program uh, requirement, um, domestic uh, sourcing. The EV issue is interesting because it's, it's, it's outside of uh, uh, you know, my immediate writ, but. Yeah, I think indisputably, and I think, you know, the, the Zeta and some of the other EV advocates, you know, said so at the time, um, you, you're, you're, you're going to restrict in the early going the number of models that are available as you are with things like AGI, you know, AGI and MSRP requirements. Uh, and I think just as it relates to EVs, one, one lesson I take is a, is a, is a comparable one to the issue around, um, uh, domestic uh, content requirements, which is you, if you if you miscalibrate the degree to which we can scale, you know, domestically, and you and you you impose a requirement sooner than that can be realistically achieved, will it have a suppressive effect on 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 deployment in the case of clean energy or on EV adoption in the case of EVs? I think indisputably yes, uh, and that's something that's going to have to be managed, and 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 also it's something that shouldn't be confused for resistance to the policy goal. Uh, that these adjacent, you know, uh, uh, provisions uh, have in mind, because I, 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 I do detect, I think Ray's correct on, from both parties, and frankly, from many, and you've heard it from Ray as a ACP member company, you're kind of an interest in, in, in expanding the domestic manufacturing base and reshoring more of the supply chain. Um, but we have to be clear-eyed about how this stuff gets rolled out in the real world and realistic timeframes uh, uh, at the pain of, of, of losing some incremental deployment if we don't get it right. Yeah, just build, building on that. Look, Clearway, uh, this has been reported last summer. Clearway was part of a uh, what they called the Solar Buyers Consortium. We banded together with a few other companies last summer and on our own volition, we put out an RFP um, looking ahead two years for the delivery of solar panels for projects that these companies have coming down the pike. And the whole idea was Let's see if we can put out, we can get contracts in place with suppliers as a whole and use our buying power to get manufacturers to scale up, give them a two-year window, and then invest 
I think the, the estimate was around $6 billion for the supply that we needed in that. And, um, and so, you know, a couple, couple observations there was we, we had a lot of interest in uh, companies that wanted to do it. And every one of those companies that came in that responded to it said, we can do this, um, but we need the advanced manufacturing tax credit um, in, or, in order to be able to do it and to scale up to that level in, ad in addition to what you guys are doing, which is interesting and speaks to what I think we were talking about before about if you're going to incentivize domestic manufacturing and bringing and bringing developing this capability here, what's the right incentive? And not one of those companies said tariffs were the right incentive. They all said that the the, uh, the manufacturing tax credit was the right way to go. Um, but but to Bill's point, with the um, with the um, um, to Bill's point with the um, uh, how this is going to work and getting the 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 uh, ratio wrong in the um, in uh, domestic content um, uh, goals and so forth. This, you know, we're building a to to use probably an inappropriate analogy here. Um, you know, we're building a sports car. We've built a sports car, and this thing's ready to go. And um, and the IRA um, has helped us to get there, and we can see the track in front of us. And a number of these things, like domestic content, the other things that you're talking about, are like slapping governors on that on how fast you're gonna be able to move and when. And it's it's not a question of them not working, it's a question of getting it tuned in correctly. And I think that's where we're at now. And as we look at things like treasury guidance or um, you know the permitting uh, bill that I, I'm sure we're gonna talk about later, among other things, we need to get all these things right so that when that car gets let loose on the, um, on the track, it's just going as fast as it can down there and providing all the benefits that it can to the United States, to workers, to people on the right, to people on the left, et cetera. Yeah, I really like that analogy, not inappropriate at all. Um, <laughs> so before we turn to uh, uh, a question from the, the, the audience, let me let me ask here, because you know, I promise we get back to the kind of the kitchen table issues, the consumer level issues. And you talk about the certainty that is in this bill that will allow these projects to, to come to fruition on a faster timeline, deliver lower price power to, to individuals, everyday consumers. Yeah, I spend too much time in the policy arena, not enough time in the applied arena. Give me a sense for the, the timeline associated before consumers actually feel the benefits of this, because obviously inflation across the board is out of control right now, particularly in energy markets. So how is this bill going to affect and when is this bill going to affect average consumers and they're going to see some positive effects from it? You know, maybe, maybe, John, did you want to start on this? Yeah, maybe I can jump in on that first. Um, unfortunately, a, a lot of times we look at these things at a macro scale and clearly you could argue that on a macro scale, it is going to drive down price, uh, which will ultimately drive down, uh, drive down costs, which will ultimately drive down price. The issue is there's other dynamics um, that are in play. So as some of our members are seeking to decarbonize, they're, they're both retiring coal plants um, and shifting to cleaner energy sources, but at the same time, they're having significant load growth in some markets. So the gap that they have to fill is, is significant and the rate at which they can do that, bringing in new resources and especially replacing those that are uh, already amortized there it does put upward pressure on price so it's going to be a matter of regional differences and what the underlying uh, supply is uh, what their optionality is relative to um, resources we have some places that have a good transmission good opportunities for renewables good opportunities for um, electrification we have other markets that don't have those same attributes. And some of those may take uh, transmission and that could take a decade to develop. So there's, it's, it's gonna be uneven, unfortunately, but I would say in the long haul, yes, it'll drive down uh, prices to decarbonize, but the rate of change is gonna look very different depending on where people start. Thanks, John. Anyone, anyone else wanna jump in on that? Kind of the timeline that people are going to experience here and, and the impact it's going to have on, on retail prices. 
I certainly agree with John in terms of how it will uh, vary depending on on specific location. And I think he brought up one point in particular, and uh, Ray might have been alluding to this with the permitting bill. But um, as a as it relates to individual projects, some of these credits will pass through immediately. Some will go into development cycles, which uh, customers will start to see the benefit from in a year or two. But then there's a broader issue of transmission. Uh, and how long it'll take transmission to come into play, um, because obviously that will take longer and start to connect markets that will enable uh, renewables. But um, that's an area that we're particularly focused on at the moment, um, and has probably one of the longer time horizons in terms of when individuals and uh, companies, whichever consumers that may be, uh, start to actually see those benefits come in. Excellent, thank you. All right, let's pivot to a question that we received from the audience. And again, anyone that's participating in this conversation today, feel free to submit uh, using that tab on your screen there. Uh, we got a question from Brian Heelman. I'll, I'll read it quickly here. My understanding is that solar or standalone storage projects currently under construction will now automatically qualify for 30% ITC and immediately see returns. But the excitement seems to be about the PTC where solar earns a credit for each kilowatt hour generated for the first 10 years of a project's life. The PTC will be more valuable for large CNI and utility scale projects, do you agree? How do you see this shaping up in the future? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in there and I appreciate the question in part because it points out, gives me another bite at the apple here. I, I probably should have mentioned at the top. So thank you for the astute question. Um, among the other uh, sort of highlights that I think people should appreciate in the IRA is that, um, between now and, and the end of 2024, the solar PTC is reinstated. So people who've been at this uh, game long enough will recall we used to have one, <laughs> uh, it fell off. It is reinstated now. Um, and uh, and to, to the other premise to the question, it is also the case that if you have um, projects that have started construction, but not yet placed in service, uh, and he, he was mentioning particularly solar technology, uh, are gonna benefit from, for will we'll receive full value. And so both the, the premises to the question, I think are accurate and I appreciate them being highlighted. I, I, to, the, to the point about the availability of the solar PTC, yeah, in general, production tax credits become relatively more valuable as costs come down and capacity factors go up. Um, and so I think that's that has been true in onshore wind. We, we project that it will become increasingly true for solar. Obviously, it's where the solar is, is deployed is going to matter, right? It, the, the more, the, the better the resource, the greater the relative advantage uh, for the PTC um, uh, and so forth. So that needs to be considered. Um, the last point I'll make before stepping back here is as of Jan 1, 2025, for, for projects to start then, we kind of glossed over this, but um, I'll do 12 seconds on it. There's a transition from the legacy sort of, I'm gonna call it the ITC PTC chassis and into uh, an emissions-based tech neutral uh, analog system uh, that was um, uh, Chairman Wyden has been championing since for some time now. Uh, and there is an there's, there's inherent credit optionality in, in those credits that come into force in 2025 where technologies can claim whether they wish the ITC or the PTC, whichever they think works best for them, uh, and you know, so we're, rather than being shoehorned by statute into having to claim a particular uh, kind of credit, and that will start in 2025. So there's there's optionality of out, out of the gate here, and then also built into the cake for project to start construction after 2025. And it's a great question. Yeah, the, the one thing I would say, just to build on what uh, Bill said, is that the um, we're, we've been interested and we've been engaged. Um, with the chairman's office relative to this tech neutral approach, because I think for our our members that look to build a portfolio, they're 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 not as interested in individual resources as they are resource attributes, because you need to be able to put things together that uh, provide you the greatest reliability, flexibility, cost, and hit that sweet spot. So I think having a tech neutral approach. Um, really aids in our ability to get to uh, decarbonization in in kind of the optimal way and, and rather than doing what's possible doing what's optimal and um so we think that uh 
that's going to be very interesting when that starts to come into play. And you can look at a variety of other green technologies that, that could um, be able to uh, meet the requirements to get those credits. Great. Let me let me ask a, a question. Uh, unless anyone else wanted to jump in on on the question from the audience, I'm going to uh, pivot a little bit to vehicles, the electrification of vehicles, and we touched on that a little bit with the consumer based EV tax credit. And I might have thrown a little bit of shade at that because I do not like the domestic sourcing requirements that are in that tax credit. But uh, that's just one of several provisions in the IRA that speak to vehicle electrification. There's also U.S. Postal Service has a, a program to, to convert their, tr their their current fleet to electric vehicles. There's infrastructure provisions. There's heavy truck uh, heavy trucks. There's um, uh, used vehicles. A new tax credit for used EVs. Tell me, did did the IRA hit the nail on the head when it comes to electrifying uh, vehicles in this country? Did it miss the mark, or did it fall somewhere in between? You know, you there were some trade-offs. Sure, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Dark, and, and, there, yeah. uh, and, and only be, not because EVs are, are, are in, in our sweet spot, but because I, I, I chair something called the Clean Incentives Coalition and, and the EV uh, community is, is an important part of that. So I have some situational awareness here. There, listen, there were a set of trade-offs in the final agreement around uh, EV incentives. On the one hand, the per manufacturer cap uh, was removed. Uh, and if had it not been removed, uh, it likely would have been benefiting um, uh, new entries uh, from from uh, imports uh, on, on a on a go forward basis. Uh, and so now manufacturers can can you know benefit or their customers can benefit from the credit without an arbitrary cap on you know how many they can sell before that uh, benefit goes away. That's thing one. Um, thing two is. Yeah, there are. We touched on this earlier. There are uh, a lot of conditions on this. Uh, there's MSRP. There's AGI. Um, there is uh, sourcing requirements uh, for the battery and for the critical minerals that go into the battery. Um, uh, I think that is. I think. I think this is going to be a classic case of the importance of of, of calibrating this uh, if one wants to avoid suppressing um, uh, uptake. Uh, for for an inability, not not an unwillingness, but like literally an inability uh, to to comply uh, with those with those requirements. I'm I'm really glad that you mentioned the the used uh, uh, the, the used EV uh, credit because I think that's that's sort of underreported. And you know, at any given point in time, about 70% of the car buying public is in the market for a used car. Uh, and I think this 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 and, and by the way the that those sourcing requirements do not apply to used EVs. Uh, I think that's appropriate. These were manufactured before you know any of that was under discussion, uh, and I think I think it it's sending a signal that this is envisioned to be a mass you know a, a mass market a transition over time. All are welcome, uh, and all, all all can all can benefit from a choice uh, to 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 go get themselves uh, uh, an EV under the provisions in the IRA. <clears throat> You know, I would say one thing on on EVs is that uh, and it was mentioned about the Postal Service. I do think um, as uh, electric fuel providers, I think we're starting to look at EVs and actually think the catalyst of fleet transformation may be bigger than the light duty incentives. Because over time, uh, you know, we really start to see uh, large chunks of EVs being deployed in large fleets, whether it's the Postal Service, Amazon, others. And <clears throat> we think that may move the needle as, as much as anything. But we probably share the concern about um, any additional requirements that are placed on it relative to domestic content or sourcing only serves to add complexity, which uh, just by the nature of it uh, slows the process and may make adoption not happen as readily. It, the only the only thing I wanted to add the only thing I want to add to the discussion here is is back to what we were talking about before about the supply demand imbalance that exists in the United States across all these technologies and you can't talk about electrification EV deployment without talking about battery sourcing 
And, you know, just to sort of right set everybody, you know, currently um, about 77% of global battery cell production is in East Asia, 13% in Europe, and only about 10% in North America. And yet for EV batteries and for standalone storage projects, you know, most of the demand worldwide now and the growth that you see in that area is in the United States, which again speaks to the fact that we, for the time being, while this ramps up, while production of EV batteries and standalone storage batteries ramps up in the United States, we need to be able to source these things thoughtfully and internationally. And, you know, about six weeks, eight weeks ago, you know, there was talk about, um, you know, uh, an additional tariff putting on import batteries imported from Southeast Asia and China specifically. And that sort of thing will bring all this stuff to a, to a screeching halt. Um, and I just wanted to flag that because again, moving strategically towards the goals that we, we've set out in the IRA with an eye towards ramping up production in the United States and being able to get the supply that we need to meet demand is critical to moving quickly and in, in achieving these targets. Hey, Brandon, so an, another you. dot or two to connect just on this, obviously. So we, we spent earlier in this conversation time talking about decarbonizing the grid writ large. Um, that's, uh, that's outside the context of incremental load growth relative to beneficial electrification, whether that's coming from the transportation sector or the built environment or what have you. Um, that makes it all the more critical, and I just I, I do want to lift this up, the need for transmission to connect resource to load. In most places, 90% of what's waiting to interconnect is clean. Uh, the need for transmission, which is not automatic, but sometimes assumed in these models, is a very real thing. And, and the need for permitting reform, which unfortunately was sort of deferred uh, last night, is also going to be critically important to achieve these objectives over the next decade. <clears throat> You know, and I, I agree with that. And I think Bill's right. The one thing I will say is besides the IRA, there's a lot of activity at FERC who's responsible with their um, notice of proposed rulemaking on transmission to update some of the cost allocation and Q issues that all of us are very aware of. And I'll set permitting aside, but um, we just want to make sure that we go into uh, any changes, which, you know, we're supportive generally of the changes, but we want to make sure that uh, for all of those projects in the queue that there's some uh, good standards of cost rigor to make sure that there's uh, the queue isn't loaded with speculative projects that may not get done or get done at such a high price that it ends up rolling additional cost into, um, into the consumer's electric bill. So we're trying to look at transmission from a standpoint of how do we clean up and have the right standards of cost consciousness in the queue formation and then also all the way through the project development. So that kind of tees up my next question, I think nicely. So we are almost done with this work period in Congress right now. It doesn't look like permitting reform is gonna be part of the continuing resolution, unfortunately. Um, as we turn our sights to a lame duck session of Congress, there is the potential for a large tax package. I think the child tax credit, R&D amortization, a bunch of provisions could be thrown into that potentially. What, if you have the ear of Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell, whomever, and have the ability to say, hey, this is what we really need. The IRA is done, the ink is dry on the IRA. This is what we really need to unleash clean energy. These are the provisions we need to put into this tax package. What are you telling them? You know, the, the, the biggest thing that had been in the Build Back Better Act and was removed uh, in the final negotiation as part of this clean energy tax platform was a transmission ITC. Um, and uh, I think that continues to be of interest um, to, you know, to accelerate the transmission build, we know we're going to need for, for grid security uh, to, you know, access lower cost electrons from broader footprints to integrate, you know, uh, uh, renewables uh, and so forth. It also it, it also helps, you know, reduce the cost allocation challenge by 30 percent, you know, by reducing the cost by 30 uh, percent. So if there's an opportunity 
uh, to get that back on the table. Uh, I, you know, certainly in an extenders process, we, uh, I know our members would be interested in that. We'll be pursuing that. But to your point, we're having a, an energy conversation, a clean energy conversation today. I, as you as you point out in your in your question. Extenders is not just about energy tax; it's about all kinds of tax, and and I think I I do think there is a, a broad and understandable sense among a lot of policymakers that you know they just spent three hundred sixty nine billion dollars over ten years on the clean energy sector, and they, they, there were some things that got left out that they're going to be interested in addressing, and and so we you know we may have a little bit of a hill to climb there, but as we've said to them before, you know we understand why it had to come out, and think the IRA was was better to pass uh, th than not. But it's the idea is as important as it ever was, notwithstanding the political votes, and we need to find a way to, to get the, the transmission built. I could jump in. Um, I, I agree wholeheartedly with Bill. I, I would just say that leg, legislatively, between now and the end of the year, as soon as possible, um, even in the even in the next year, if need be, um, transmission um, uh, tax credit, the ITC is is critical. We we. The IRA supercharges a lot of things, but the one thing that it doesn't address and get done is all of the needed transmission that needs to be built so that the, the, all these projects that are being built, the power can get wielded to where it's needed. Just to be clear, that will help to relieve congestion. It will save ratepayers' costs in the long run, and it will help to make a number of goals that are in the IRA uh, a reality. Um, the second piece is not sure if this is relevant for the um, the, the budget package, but um, permitting reform. Um, it was a disappointment that it didn't make it into the CR um, this week, um, but that too is critical in order so that we can get timeframes down, like on a transmission project that can take 10 years to get permitted, to get that down to about half of that, and that again will help to move all this stuff forward uh, quickly. Um, just two quick things that I think are that aren't legislated, but that we need to keep in mind uh, so that all this stuff moves forward from a government perspective is guidance out of Treasury on the IRA. This we're all working on this now. It is an enormous undertaking that's expected to take six to 12 months to the extent that that can be um, short circuited and, and move forward quicker will be will be critical to doing things like getting financing done on projects that are ready to go now or within that first six months. And then finally, as, as we've talked, when it comes to hitting you know, some of the goals in the IRA, the labor provisions, the uh, domestic content and so forth, you know, patience with uh, things like tariffs and not just pulling the trigger on tariffs in the meantime and letting manufacturing ramp up so that we can source those things here and not inadvertently curtail supply or in, un needlessly uh, increase pricing. Um, um, and I'll stop there. At the risk of being Mark a broken Jones, record, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, just perhaps re-emphasizing two things. Uh, transmission, I mentioned it before, but it is a top priority for us. It is a constraining factor on realizing the benefits of the IRA and also providing reliable and cheap power across the nation. And then the second is uh, guidance. We, uh, as an investor, are, are not a party, and I think many of the folks who participate in a similar role as us, we generally aren't taking the risk of what the specifics of, a, of uh, some of perhaps the credits might look like over time. And so we really can't rely on that until the language is out there and, and it's final. So um, that's something that um, is a, is a near-term gating item to actually having this IRA be implemented successfully. And I would say the same thing. I think Treasury guidance is something we're we're generating our questions right now and and uh, trying to make sure we understand how this is likely to be uh, implemented and ensuring that there is flexibility in those cases where we can't meet some of the additional requirements, I think will be very important. And relative to transmission, I think uh, permitting reform is something that uh, we share the view it, it needs to happen, and hopefully we, it can be done in a way that doesn't kind of obliterate existing authorities and regional planning, but but still gets the gets the goal met. Outstanding. 
Well, we're hitting 1145 here. So we're at the end of our discussion. I love to end on a note of unanimity. All of the panelists, even the moderator agrees that permitting reform is a very, very high priority for this Congress. So hopefully they will set aside partisan uh, squabbling and get this done. Thank you so much for the panel. You guys did an outstanding job. Thank you to our audience for tuning in today. Thank you to Crest for organizing this whole thing. We hope you enjoy the rest of National Clean Energy Week. Thank you. Thank you.